We uh, are now going to segue to a presentation uh, that's going to be delivered by Jeff Howe, uh, our last questioner from the last session. Um, Jeff is the, this segment is entitled Harnessing the Wisdom of the Crowd. Jeff, as he mentioned, is an professor, assistant professor at Northeastern University. He's the author of the book Crowdsourcing, Why the Power of the Crowd is, di is Driving the Future of Business, a uh, book that came out in 2008. Um, it, most of you, I think, picked up one of our programs um, that Alicia, who works here, was very creative in designing as a, an instruction manual. So this would be step three, the very important step that some of us often do not do, which is asking for help. So that's what we're going to hear about now, crowdsourcing. Jeff also runs the Twitter book club, One Book 140 for the Atlantic. Um, Jeff? Thanks a lot. Don't ask me for help. I just, I just write about this stuff. Um, all right, so first, this gets really anticlimactic because now I have to spend the next three minutes nattering while I plug in the system. So I want to thank Slate, New America Foundation, ASU for having me here. It's a lot of fun. Um, I, so I coined the word crowdsourcing, which means I've wound up talking about it a lot for a long time. And I've never, I've always wanted to wind up in the same room with maker folk. And because I, I write about it, and it's in my book. And this was, I was really fascinated and enjoyed the last panel a lot. So thanks, guys. All right, so I like to start off with a movie because people like movies. And, um, and that way, if you've never heard of crowdsourcing before, which happened to me a lot in the beginning and happens to me very rarely now, um, it puts us all on the same page. All right, can we dim the house lights up here so the video? Is there an event person in the? Otherwise, it's going to be kind of lame. Just like that, can I, um, that one has to stay on. Well, you guys tell me if it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> oh, and we need sound. <laughs> yeah. to get together through intent, through shared interest. This is new. This is a fundamentally new development in the course of human history, that communities are able to form simply out of shared interest, a shared passion for a hobby, a craft, an art. So crowdsourcing is, is when a company takes a job that was once performed by employees and outsources it in the form of an open call to a large, undefined group of people generally using the internet. There's a couple crucial terms in there. One is open call and the other is undefined. And they both get the same idea, that the person who you think would be best qualified to perform a job isn't always the best person to do it. And the cocktail party version is very simple. It's, it's crowdsourcing is Wikipedia with everything. Photography is, is a great example because it's what I think of as the canary and the coal mine. What's happened over recent years in photography is the advent of three separate developments. The first is the digital camera, the cheap, affordable SLR digital camera. The second is photo editing software, which has become easier and easier to use. And the third, of course, is the internet. And so the quality level of stock photos produced by amateurs essentially reached an equilibrium with those created by professionals. What happened was that stock photos were no longer a scarce commodity. They became an abundant commodity. Instead of charging $300 per stock photo, they charged a dollar. And as you can imagine, the demand for a commodity that had been marked down by 99% was 
was huge. I don't think crowdsourcing eradicates a business, it just changes it dramatically. It forces companies to approach us as potential partners, and that's much more interesting and much more exciting. We do buy things, but we also participate meaningfully in the process by which those products are created. What we see with these successful forms of crowdsourcing is that they came up organically from the people formerly known as customers, from the people formerly known as the audience. The technology is so good that it's become easier for people to become very good. And then finally, the emergence of online communities. I like to think about the online community as, as kind of the building block of crowdsourcing. It's, it's what the corporation is to the industrial era. It showed that people could come together and self-organize into productive units. What once took uh, managers in a corporate hierarchy can now be done in the context of the community. All right, so now we know what it is, right? Um, I'm always kind of embarrassed by that because it's Wired made that right before the book came out. I worked at Wired for a long time when I was working there. When I, when I coined the word, it was for a Wired article. And, uh, and the thing about those movies are is they, they make you take like 10 takes. So you start out really excited, but like maybe too excited. Then you get really just like bored. And then they're like, no, no, we need that passion back. And so you wind up looking really phony. You're like, the thing about crowds. I'm so embarrassed by it. All right, so, um, so welcome to a totally new, I get really bored with my decks after like a year, so I just totally reinvent them and cook up new stuff. So this is what I've been looking at lately. I've been following crowdsourcing on and off since 2005, because um, it certainly pre-existed the word, um, although there weren't nearly as many pretty incredible examples as there are now. Um, this is some of the stuff I'm looking at. Um, I'll tell you what you're looking at. I'll tell you what you're not looking at. You are not looking at a retroviral um, protease from the Mason Pfizer monkey virus. What you're looking at is a proposed design for the retroviral protease from the Mason Pfizer uh, monkey virus. Um, the reason it's a proposed design is for a long, long, long time, over 10 years, no one could figure out what the design of it was. It's an enzyme, and enzymes are composed of proteins. How these proteins fold determine their function, and sometimes that function is to make us really, really sick. In fact, in the case of this one, it's to kill us. Um, figuring out, obviously, uh, uh, what that function is uh, helps us cure such diseases. Um, so it was something of a coup in September when a group of researchers published an article uh, in the journal Nature, uh, Structure and Molecular Biology, um, that after years of a, quote, wide range of attempts, end quote, they had successfully modeled the crystal structure of the, it's commonly called the MPMV, or monkey retrovirus protein. Um, among the co-authors uh, was a very unusual name the Fold It Void Crushers group. Um, not often seen in the, in the venerable pages of a nature journal. Um, so what was the Fold It Void Crushers group? Um, it was a collection of video game players, uh, many of them without uh, even college degrees, much less backgrounds in nanobiotechnology. Um, and they were from all around the world. And after years of all these wide range of attempts, the attempt that worked uh, for the collection of University of Washington uh, molecular biologists, computer scientists, and video game designers that had created Foldit was to turn the search for the MPMV retrovirus into a video game. And that's this. All right. Um, So we're going to return to nanobiotechnology, but uh, before we do that, let's give a little bit of history. I do like talking about the history of the term because, oh, I want to show that, yeah, get back, get back. Um, uh, it, it reveals, I, you know, yeah, it, it reveals something about the phenomenon itself uh, and how it's come to be framed. I mean, that's certainly been uh, a collaborative effort, but uh, uh, I, I think how, how that term first came about reveals something about the DNA of it. Um, so in, in, uh, I was a Wired contributing editor from uh, 2000 to 
2010, roughly. And 2005 was what I was thought was my year of the kid. I covered music for a long time, the music industry. And in the spring, summer of 2005, I was writing about MySpace. At the time, no, uh, to the extent anyone knew about MySpace, and, and there weren't, it's hard to imagine, you know, it's, it's meteoric rise and just as uh, precipitous fall. Um, but to the extent people knew about it, all they knew it as it was disrupting the, 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 the music industry because uh, bands were going, uh, you know, they call it going, going band to fan. Um, they would book their tour, find sofas to sleep on, sell merch, distribute their, their singles. Uh, so I was writing about the effect that MySpace was having on the music industry. And so as part of that, I, I basically spent the summer on the Vans uh, Warped Tour. Um, which, uh, has anyone else been on the Vans Warped Tour? It was, I had a blast, it was awesome. Um, I'm old, but I still skateboard, so I like doing stuff like this. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time with kids and their tools, and their facility with those tools uh, was so stunning, and, and, and this is not, uh, you know, a uh, 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 you know an epiphany for anyone in this room. But the the, uh, uh, the next thought was it was that uh, to them, uh, you know, a uh, uh, you know f flash software or 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 anything web design or are their video cameras, their DSLRs. It's 2005, pre DSLR. Their cameras um, were what pencils were to us. And I mean, at Wired, there's this real culture. We're very focused on the technology. And the technology is the story. And I was like, this technology. Technology is just not the point for these kids. And the point wasn't that uh, they, they were learning how to take cool videos because they wanted to be a videographer. That was just completely foreign to them. No, it's just, I want to make a video. Um, and, and that felt very new to me. And at the time, we were very focused on user-generated content. And I thought that that was a, a loathsome term um, because, you know, no, we aren't users and, and no one sits down to generate and when we do, we don't make content. I mean, content alone you could have me on for an hour about. But, uh, and, uh, but more than that, I was like, there's no way this is going to be restricted to content. Like, why are we setting up this weird artificial parameter around content? Because really what's happening is a revolution concerning the means of production. And we produce all sorts of stuff, uh, not just content. So I didn't have a word. Uh, and the article came out and had none of this in it. But in that way that, as the journalists in the room will relate to, uh, you know, the, the, the seed for, for your next story is embedded in, in, in the the. the you know, the ground for the first. Uh, you know, I knew that I was on to my next thing. I just, it was all very inchoate. Uh, and so I, I called my editor at one point, and, I, and, and what I had was this metaphor um, and friendly wired illustrator types that are willing to make my slides for me. Um, uh, the metaphor was that in focusing, and remember this is 2006, on user-generated content, everyone was staring, uh, standing around Old Faithful saying, look, this is the phenomenon. This is this badass thing. It shoots up exactly every 43 minutes, and, um, and this is what we should all be focused on. I just had this idea that everyone was gathered around this, and no one was looking at the fact that there were actually other little guys are shooting up. Maybe that had nothing to do with content. Um, and in fact, Eric Von Hippel was my first little geyser because I would just started frantically calling people and one of them was Eric Von Hippel mentioned in the previous panel. Um, he's at MIT and has actually been looking at user generated innovation since the 80s. Uh, and um, so it was already happening in of all things the integrated circuit board. Uh, engineers who were buying integrated circuits and then saying, I can make this better than your engineers because I use this thing, you don't, you just make it. Um, so I want to make it on my own. Uh, and so the company started saying, yeah, sure, you can do that. So I knew I had these little geysers that had nothing to do with content. Um, I, uh, uh, a lot of the discussion I was having with um, Mark Robinson, uh, my, my editor at Wired, uh, revolved around uh, the fact that this would be a disruption. Um, it's also great promise. I mean, you know, clearly you look at something like this and, and you recognize it's, it's that there's a democratizing potential um, and, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, an egalitarian aspect, um, but also a, a huge disruptive uh, influence that I, I would argue actually we're only now beginning to see and will get worse um, before uh, uh, equilibrium is reached. Um, and so he said it's like outsourcing to the crowd, and I said, or crowdsourcing. Um, so uh, that, that was the birth of the word, anyway. Uh, and the article came out in June 2006. So we took this 
uh, slide right before the article came out. Uh, it, there were three hits on Google. They're all written by people who worked at Wired or slept with people who worked at Wired. Um, and, and then this was like two weeks later, which I don't actually believe that 700,000 people are writing about crowdsourcing already. I think that Google Analytics are really weird. Um, but anyway, now it's like nine million. And certainly it did kind of take off. Um, and it's by far not the best article I've ever written, although it was a pretty good feat of reporting. I spent six months, I probably talked to 50 people. There weren't that many examples to make my case, that there were many geysers, and what we should be looking at is the tectonic shift that was actually uh, you know, creating uh, a, 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 a situation in which you would see these surface manifestations. Um, uh, th so it took me six months to find the geysers. And the big breakthrough, uh, and I mention it in the video, um, but was stock photography, where you had a case that uh, uh, the crowd was undercutting, was completely uh, you know, total disruption of, of the stock photo industry. It's a, it's a small industry, um, you know, $2 billion. It's about the same price. I looked this up because I was curious for gl uh, the global market for orchids. It's also $2 billion. Um, uh, but, you know, you had one very large public company, Getty, um, that had to uh, f find a private buyer. Um, they found a private equity buyer and, and were smart enough to buy iStock Photo um, for around $52 million. Uh, after having said that these guys were barbarians at the gates, they're the amateurs, we don't need to worry about them, um, they turned out to worry about them, and they saved Getty's business. It's now the most profitable part of Getty's business. Um, so I, all of this is animated. Uh, maybe this is old hat to everyone. I hope it is, because it would say that this, this, these simple words, which deserve to be known by everyone, are known by everyone. If not, it is uh, uh, from Bill Joy, co-founder of Sun Microsystems, that no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. Adam, how am I on time? All right. Um, so that's about right. So uh, my favorite illustration of Joy's Law, just because it's so damn simple, um, is Innocentive. How many people in the room know about Innocentive? All right, good bit, I can still talk about it. Um, so Innocentive was a project started by Eli Lilly, by an Eli Lilly researcher named uh, Alf Bingham in 2000. And the idea was is even as many awesome PhD super smarties we have uh, in our halls, um, we certainly, Bill Joy's law, uh, don't have enough. And we get stumped on pro projects and, and problems. So what would happen if we took a problem and we posted it to the world? Uh, common idea now, the XPRIZE format, not so common then. Um, so they created, well essentially it was just a, a, a bulletin board for scientists. And they hired some people to go around the world, and, and especially going around the world, because a lot of the underutilized scientific intellectual capital exists in the former Soviet Union, uh, uh, India to some extent, China, um, and got scientists to sign up on this uh, bulletin board so they would be able to see a problem. Um, and uh, uh, lo, it was good. Um, about one third of the problems were successfully solved. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, except that when you think of the, these are problems posted by Eli Lilly uh, once they opened it up, uh, big consumer uh, packaging goods firms like Colgate Palmolive, uh, places that employ a lot of very smart people who can solve their problems. The problems that had stumped them, one third of them were being solved. Um, uh, flash forward four or five years, Kareem Lakhani, uh, he's now at Harvard Business School, um, but at the time he was actually working with Eric uh, at MIT, uh, does a case study about an incentive, trying to figure out how it works. He found three very, very interesting things. The first was that one third of all problems were solved. The second was that, and this is just amazing, um, that there's a positive correlation between success and distance from field, which is wonk speak for the idea that the less accredited you were for a problem, the better chance you had at solving the thing. So if you were a, and, and this was, I mean, anecdotally, I saw this over and over again. I would interview successful incentive solvers. They didn't even, if they were chemists, they didn't even bother looking at the chemistry problems. Why? Who can say why? Why would the chemist not look at the chemistry problem? 
It's already stumped all the chemists, right? So, I mean, why are they going to look at that? So they look at, you know, the crystallography problems. They look at stuff that they know nothing about, that they can apply their unique intelligence to a completely new domain. Um, and finally, that the winners knew the answer. Again, this is, you know, think back to fold it. This 10 years of microbiology stumped. These answers that had stumped some of the best experts in their field, the winners knew whether or not they could solve it in 20 minutes. So it was, it was knowledge that was already uh, existing for them. In the interest of time, I won't tell you about Yuri Bodrov, although he exemplifies all the above lessons, because um, I really want to go back to Aterna, uh, back to nanobiotechnology and leave you with that. So Aterna was started by Adrian Troy. He was one of the co-founders of Foldit. Um, and it is, uh, for the sake of the brevity of this presentation, a, a lot like Foldit, except with instead of looking for proteases, they're looking for synthetic RNA, the big difference is that, is that every week they take the best gamers, right? So it's a video game, just like Fold It. People, are, people of all ages, some as young as 11, are designing RNA. They take short uh, tutorials. Uh, and then the difference is that at the end of every week, Adrian Troy and his team at Carnegie Mellon take the, the leaderboard, the top 10 designs for synthetic RNA, and they actually synthesize them in the test tube, see if they work for real or not, and then plug it back in to the, uh, 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 you know, into the video game. And, and, and what I really love about this, I'll just let this play while I finish up, is that, um, uh, they utilize something that I saw again and again in the last six years of research, which, uh, you know, we can call it competitive collaboration. It is being called competitive collaboration. You can come in, and if you don't like your design, you can take the winner, the one at the very top of the leaderboard, and just poach his complete design, and then you can try and improve it. Um, and what this has meant is that uh, it's, it's, it's given the collective the ability to uh, to uh, accelerate their discovery and improve their results much faster than any individual could. And much faster, it's worth pointing out, Fold It arose out of Rosetta. Does anyone know what Rosetta at home was? It was millions, remember how brilliant all this was going to be? SETI at home, millions of computers that together were going to figure out how proteins fold. Guess what, all that magic computing power? It couldn't do it. That was one of the approaches that failed. It was three weeks of this stuff of 11-year-olds with amazing pattern recognition. They were the ones who were able to do it. Um, what are the applications? I don't know, but I found this, which is an RFP from DARPA. And, and uh, they're going to, uh, they want to use the same gamification principles to identify security flaws uh, in, uh, you know, our global mill gov networks you guys are from washington you know what that means i don't but you know uh uh, uh you know I, in our national security uh computer systems and who designed the rfp fold it so uh I, I would propose if it does not sound like hyperbole that the sky is the limit for this stuff um looking forward to do we have time for q a um, yeah. no all right well uh, i'm at crowdsourcing if anyone wants to ping me Questions, answers, complaints. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>